Recording started. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the word photography, it means writing with light. So the, word, the light part comes from the photo and the graphy comes from the, uh, the writing comes from the graphy part. And um, I forget what the, there's some sort of science of handwriting analysis, you know, you've probably heard of that before, like if you're, if someone kind of writes to the right or to the left or that sort of thing, you can figure out what their personality is like and that sort of thing. So anyways, yeah, it's interesting. So that's what photography means. And um, second point here is talking about the reason why, you know, we have cameras that have lenses in them instead of cameras that are just like a little pinhole cameras like the first one started with. Um, the lens helps you to focus light, right? You know how, um, I don't know if you have glasses, um, but glasses will focus light on one point, right? And so, uh, so that's the purpose of the lens is to focus the light on one point. Whereas with a pinhole camera, it does do the job, but it, it, the light is kind of a little more spread out, eh? So that's the reason we want a, a lens. And um, of course, the better the lens, the better the camera. Um, so this is a, a picture that shows some of the basics of the camera. Now, this one actually shows a film camera, but it shows two important parts that we're going to talk about. One is the aperture, and the aperture is the opening and it's kind of like the iris of your eye. You know, it opens larger or smaller depending on how much light you want to let in. And the shutter is this part behind, and the shutter is kind of like an, an all or none sort of thing, like it, come, it opens and closes. But what the shutter does is it's kind of a time thing. So depending on how long the shutter is open, that's how much light's going to get in. Okay, so both the aperture and the shutter deal with how much light is entering your camera, but this one, the, the aperture um, governs the amount of light by, by how large the hole is. So a small hole is going to let in a small amount of light, large hole is going to let in a large amount of light, whereas the shutter is more like if it's open a long time, then it lets in more light, and if it's open a short time, it lets in a smaller amount of light. But they're kind of similar in some ways as well. Okay, so this is showing you like different apertures. A small one, as you can see, lets in a small amount of light, so it's a really dark picture, right? Whereas this is a really large aperture, and so you get a really bright picture. Okay, so here's something. Um, so how would you say like both the aperture and the shutter have a job in common? Can you think of what their job would be that's in common? They both control the amount of what coming into your camera? Yeah, the amount of light. And so the aperture, it's again, uh, depending on the size of the aperture, that's how much light's going to get in. And the shutter, it depends on how long it's open. Okay? So if we were saying <clears throat> the aperture controls what, what would you say it controls, just even looking at these pictures? So these ones here have to do with the aperture. Okay, brightness. Um, but as well, what I was kind of also wanting to get at was just they control the, the size of the opening. Okay. Um, okay, so, but you're right. It's, it's going to determine how bright the picture is going to be, for sure. Okay, this next part here says the part of the camera that controls how long light enters the camera. Do you remember what that is again? That's right, that's going to be the shutter. Good. It's almost kind of like the idea of a window shutter in ways. Eh? Um, question number six, it says, these kind of cameras are more expensive than point and shoot digital cameras. They give the photographer more control over how pictures turn out. Those are called DSLR cameras. I'll just put that on here, DSLR. And so what it stands for is, um, Okay, SLR stands for single lens reflex. So it's basically digital single lens reflex. So those are more expensive cameras. If you see someone with a really big lens, chances are they have a DSLR cameras. You know, when people are going to like sporting events and things like that, they usually have a DSLR camera. Those things cost anywhere from, you know, 500 bucks, four or 500 bucks to 3,000 bucks. Um, Mr. Monroe has one that's pretty expensive. His is, um, 
a few thousand dollars or something. So uh, yeah, they're they're really nice cameras though, and they give you a lot of control over how the picture turns out. Um, okay, so this question here, number seven, says which of the following reduces camera movement and produces pictures that are more in focus? Okay, so you know that if you move your camera a lot, you're going to get a, a shaky picture, so you're going to have a lot of blur in the picture, right? Can you think of anything you can do that will help you um, to have a stable camera and so a, a good clear picture? Can you think of anything you can do as far as the way you deal with your camera? There's kind of ways that you can stabilize your camera. Can you think of a way of stabilizing it? Some ways have to do with, yeah, a tripod, that's why I put that picture up good. Um, I have a tripod, I also have a monopod, which has just one leg. It's not quite as stable as this, but um, it's easier to get into some events, you know. But another thing you can do is you can take your arm and kind of put it against your body, and then um, that stabilizes the camera. You know, if you put it against your chest sort of thing, it, it stabilizes the camera. Then there's another thing that's part of the camera itself, it's called image stabilization. And if your camera has image stabilization, then even if you shake the camera a bit, it won't be a blurry picture. So those are some of the examples of things you can do. There's even more. Uh, you can buy, a, you can use a bean bag, you know, things like that. Okay, this is kind of a cool picture. Um, <clears throat> so basically what this is showing is someone used a really high shutter speed. And when you use a really high shutter speed, you usually use that in sports photography and stuff like that. It allows you to freeze something in time, right? So of course this water is moving more quickly than the picture suggests, but it looks like the guy has a hat. That thing's actually called a water hat. Um, so it says in order to freeze action, such as a moving basketball player, you could use a shutter speed around. Any idea how high, how fast the speed has to be to, to be able to speed, uh, kind of stop action? Not necessarily quite this fast, but just in general. Well, you want something starting at around a, a four hundredth of a second to be able to speed, uh, stop action. So in other words, if you see someone speeding down a basketball court, if you use something with about a uh, camera with one four hundredth of the shutter speed, you'll be able to get them, you know, fairly crisp and the, the action is, uh, you know, fairly, um, fairly stopped, you could say, because of that high shutter speed. Okay. So then the next one here says, on a bright day, which of the following ISO settings tend to produce a picture that is clear and focused? Okay, so you have this um, setting on your camera. If you put it in automatic mode, then it's going to put the ISO into the correct mode for you. Um, but again, if you're using this like DSLR camera, you might want to control the ISO speed. And even, you know, even if you don't have a DSLR camera, a lot of cameras nowadays allow you to control the ISO speed. So basically on a bright day, you want a low ISO number. Okay, so you want something like, you know, ISO 100 if you're on a bright, bright sunny day, right? But if it's a, um, a dim, if you're talking about dim conditions inside the house, then you want a um, high ISO number like, say, 400, okay? So bright day, low ISO number, uh, low lighting conditions inside the house, high ISO number. Okay, and back in the olden days when most people used film, which some people do of course, but um, you had to select the film with a certain ISO number. So if you knew that you were going to go to a sporting event and you used, you know, like ISO 800 or 400 or whatever, if you knew you were going to be outside on a bright day, then you select something like ISO 100. Okay, I can't even remember what ISO stands for, but anyways. <laughs> Okay, so this here is showing us that uh, sometimes you turn your camera sideways, right, like this, and that's to take like a portrait picture. If you use it the way it normally is, that's for something like a landscape picture. <clears throat> so, um, okay, so this question is just saying holding a camera in a vertical position, position is best for, that's going to be a portrait picture, right? All right, um, sorry, I just have to do a quick check and see something about email here. Okay, looks good. Um, so this next one, question 11, says on a sunny day, a lot of light enters a camera. 
So as a result, we should select what kind of an aperture and what kind of shutter. Okay, so what I'm looking for is do you think it would be a um, small aperture on a bright sunny day or do you think it would be a large one? And do you think it would be a um, large shutter, high sh shutter speed, like fast shutter speed, or do you think it would be a show, <laughs> sorry, slow shutter speed, that's hard to say. <laughs> So what do you, let's start with the aperture. If it's a bright sunny day, you've got lots of light that, that's outside. Do you think you'd want to choose a large aperture or a small aperture? So a large opening or a small opening? That's right. Because it's so bright, you want the light that's coming in to only come through a small hole because the light that is coming through is really bright. That's right. And um, how about the shutter speed? Do you think you would want a high shutter speed or a slow shutter speed? Yep, that's right. You want a high speed like maybe, I don't know, at least 200 or something like that because, again, a lot of light's coming in so you've got to make the shutter go quickly. Otherwise, there's going to be too much light coming in. Good stuff. Okay, question 12. A dark picture could result from which of the following? So, do you think a dark picture would be a large aperture or small aperture? That's right. Um, actually, <clears throat> um, a dark picture would result from a small aperture, right? I know that we talked about a small aperture with a sunny day, but that's because if you already have a lot of brightness coming through, then you want the aperture to be small. But if there's not much light coming through, then you want to increase the aperture. You want to make a large hole so you can get all the light that's there to be able to come through. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. And with the same, it's the same reason if it's dark, you know, you're in a dark room, you want to have a slow shutter speed. You want to give it all the camera, all the time it has to be able to gather the light that's out there. Okay? All right, so question 13 says, if we open the aperture very large, then to balance things, we should use what kind of a shutter speed? Okay, so usually what you do is um, you don't want both the aperture and the shutter speed to be doing the same thing, like letting lots of light in. So if one of them is letting lots of light in, then the other one usually you kind of want it to do the opposite thing. So if the, the aperture is already very large, what kind of shutter speed do you think you would have? Okay, so the aperture is large, so does that mean we have a lot of light coming in or a little bit of light coming in? Okay, so we have a lot of light coming in. So if there's already a lot of light coming in, do we want the shutter speed to be high or low? That's right, to kind of balance things out. Good. All right, so we'll go on to the next page. Um, so this page is basically showing us that... Um, Usually when we take pictures, we, you know, we sometimes put something in the middle of a picture. There's nothing wrong with it. But overall, photographers like to try to put things a little bit off balance because it put, makes pictures look a little more interesting. So this picture is kind of more symmetrical where everything's balanced. So yeah, that's what you know, symmetry means is balance. So things are kind of equal on both sides, like the amount of space on both sides of the house and the amount of space above and below, whereas this one's a little more asymmetrical. Okay, so most of the time photographers are going to be looking for a setup where it's a little more asymmetrical. All right, now this picture here is um, showing us something here. Um, basically, the grid is divided into nine parts, okay? Um, and they have something in photography, they call it the rule of thirds. The reason it's called the rule of thirds is if you look up 
this side here is divided into three, and this side here is divided into three. So the eye of the B is a third the way along this way, and it's also a third the way along this way. So what we tend to do is we tend to put things in one of these places, one of these four places, okay, where the lines cross, and that's called the rule of thirds. Okay, so the reason it's called rule of thirds, again, is because it comes from the lines divide into thirds going each way. Okay, so but there's four points, and those four points are the best places to put the most interesting parts of your picture, because it turns out that your eye is kind of naturally directed towards those places. So if you put that, the most interesting part, you know, like a, like a person's head or their eyes sort of thing, then... Um, because your eyes are naturally directed to that part of the screen, then you've put it in exactly the right place because you want people looking at, you know, a person's eye or something like that because it's most interesting, okay? So this question is just saying, you know, why is this wolf well-placed? Well, it's well-placed because it's following the rule of thirds because you can see its eye. If we were to divide this into thirds, you know, there's a third there and there's a third there. So, and, you know, here's a third going that way. So his eye is placed in a good place for the rule of thirds. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, good. And, of course, not every picture is going to follow that, and it's hard to, you know, in the moment to be able to get pictures just that right, you know, just the proper place for it to be the rule of thirds. Um, some cameras, you can kind of press a button that will put that grid, that rule of thirds grid, and so then it's easier to kind of position people in the right place. The other thing is sometimes when you crop pictures, and you crop out, you know, parts of them, uh, you can make them follow the rule of thirds after you've taken the picture sort of thing. Okay, so that's a good thing as well. Whoa. Sorry about that. Oh, it looks like um, Mr. Monroe is calling me. Um, do you mind if I just take it real quick and then um, do you want to get a drink just while I take his call? Is that okay? Okay, I'll be right back. Hi Haley, I'm I'm back. Um, I'm gonna talk to Mr. Monroe later on. Um, just let me know when you're back.
Hi, Haley. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good stuff. So, um, all right, we'll just talk a little bit about this picture here. Um, the purpose of this picture is just to show when you have something like this branch that's here, it kind of produces a bit of a frame for the picture. Um, and so we call this framing whenever you have something that's kind of like, you know, you're looking through whatever the outside thing is. And a lot of times you have something on both sides. Like I've seen people take pictures through rocks where the rocks were kind of like a frame and the person on the other side was, you know, the thing being photographed. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about framing. Just basically using things on the outside edge to kind of make it more interesting. And it just kind of is like the frame of a picture, right? Okay. All right. So this picture is showing us kind of a different idea. Um, when we're talking about pictures, landscape pictures, the things at the front of the picture are called foreground elements, and the things that are far away are called background elements. And what's good to do when you're taking a um, landscape picture, which is you know basically taking a picture of something far away, um, it, what's good to do is to have some parts of the foreground as well as the background. Like if you didn't have any of these rocks, you just had the water, this picture might not look quite so interesting, right? But when you include some foreground elements and the background elements, it does two things. First, it makes the picture a little more interesting, but as well, it gives you a sense of how far away it is. Because it includes both the foreground and the background elements, you, your eye kind of compares the two, okay? So that's the value of um, having foreground elements. So this question here was just saying, you know, when foreground elements are included in the landscape picture, it gives you a sense of how far the objects close to you are compared to the objects far away. Gives a sense of perspective. Okay? Does that kind of make sense? Okay, good. Now this picture here is um, showing us, sometimes we take pictures we have diagonal lines, because a lot of times it's more interesting to take pictures where the lines are diagonal rather than vertical. They just somehow look more interesting when they're diagonal. The other thing it does is it kind of gives the picture a bit of a sense of mystery because it, your eyes kind of going off thinking, okay, I wonder where this goes, okay? So diagonal lines give a picture a sense of mystery. Um, okay, this is showing two different pictures. This one here is a, a close-up picture or portrait picture, whereas this one is a you know, a, a faraway picture, a landscape picture. <clears throat> so when we talk about what's called depth of field, um, a portrait picture has a shallow depth of field. And the reason it's shallow is only things that are close to you are in focus. Things that are far away are blurred. <clears throat> okay, so that's why it's a shallow depth of field. This has a, a deep depth of field, you could say. Um, a landscape picture because everything's in focus, not only things close to you, but things far away as well, okay? So when you take pictures, um, you want to take, a, you want to have a shallow depth of field for portrait pictures and you want to have a, um, a, a, a large or a long depth of field, you could say, or deep de depth of field for a, a landscape picture. All right, so on the next page, So 
says here a zoom lens is valuable for a few types of pictures. Can you think of some pictures that people might use zoom lenses for? Yeah, that's right. Far away things and um, small things. Yeah. Um, generally, um, things that are um, uh, like sports, for instance, would be, like you said, far away, like usually when you're watching sports. That's, that's an example of uh, far away type objects. Okay. Or, you know, maybe you're at a concert or something like that. All right. Uh, question 21 says, a problem with using a zoom lens when taking pictures. Well, the problem is, is that um, with a zoom lens, unless you hold the camera really, really still, just a little bit of movement with a zoom lens, you'll get a, a blurry picture, and you don't want that. Okay? So with a zoom, if you're using a zoom lens a lot of time, that's when you want to use a tripod or something to stabilize the camera. All right. So question 22. This, is, this technique is called panning. Okay? So when they took, whoever took this picture of a dog did not use a high speed picture, high, high speed. Um, like normally if something is moving fast, you use a high speed, like something like 1 400th of a second, right? When you use panning, what you do is you use a lower speed, like something like 1 60th of a second. But the reason it's called panning is because you're kind of panning your camera along at the same speed as the object is moving. So what this person would have done is as this dog was moving along, they would be kind of moving their camera along at the same speed as, as the dog. Well, not at the same speed, but you know, when you're watching something far away, you don't have to move at the same speed. You just kind of move it along, right? And uh, so that's what panning is called. And it, it makes for some interesting pictures because panning gives you the idea of movement. When you look at this picture, it gives you the idea of movement. If you took a really high speed picture, like 1 400th of a second, it wouldn't give the idea of movement. It would just freeze the dog, but you wouldn't know the dog's moving so much. But because you use something like a hundred, uh, uh, 1 over 60, a 60th of a speed for the shutter speed, uh, and, and you, then you pan along, you move the uh, camera along, that's what gives you the illusion of movement. Okay? Um, so it says with a panning picture, you are taking a picture of something that is moving fast and your shutter speed is around. This should be 1 60th of a second. Okay. So next thing says, because of the lighting provided, which of the following conditions has the fewest problems with it? Okay. So there are some different conditions. One is, for instance, really bright conditions outside. Another might be cloudy conditions. Um, and uh, another might be, uh, you know, really, really dark outside. Well, it turns out the lighting with the best conditions is, is something like a, a cloudy day, you know, or it might be like a, a bright day, but there's some clouds in the sky, okay? So if you have really bright sunlight, the problem with it is you get shadows from it. Okay, I'm sure you've tried taking pictures sometimes on a bright sunny day and you tend to get a lot of shadows on people's faces. What actually is the best day for taking pictures outside is a cloudy day because the light can still get through the cloud, but you don't have quite the bright light that produces those shadows. Okay? So the, the conditions with the fewest problem is usually kind of a, a cloudy day. All right, so this here is just showing us that for indoor pictures, some of the best pictures you can take indoors are when you put the person beside a window. And probably there was a window over here. And so the light comes in through the window, and it just makes for an interesting effect because one side of the face is brighter, the other side is more, a little more shadowed, but not you know, dark shadows. And it makes for good portrait pictures when you have someone beside a window. All right, <clears throat> now this here is showing us that uh, if you take pictures with your flash on your camera, have you ever taken a picture with a flash and the person's face looks almost white like a ghost? You ever seen that happen before? Yeah, what they call that, they call that flash blowout because the flash kind of just is too bright, right? And so what's good to do when you take an indoor picture, if you can take something like a piece of Kleenex and put it over top of your flash, 
Then you get a picture like this, where you have more even uh, lighting. And the reason is, is because the flash sort of spreads out the light more, and it makes it so it's not quite as bright. Okay? So a lot of times, uh, professional photographers will use something. They won't necessarily use a Kleenex in front of their flash, but they'll use something white that will kind of spread out the light. Hey, Samantha, how's it going? Can you hear me okay? Are you able to uh, type in the box there? Just going to type something here. Okay, good stuff. Um, hey, Samantha, we started at 2 o'clock, actually, so we're actually pretty close to being done the session. Um, but, um, hey, thanks for coming, though, anyways. And I will make up a recording of it, so once we're done, I'll just send you the recording, and you can click on the link, and you'll be able to see the whole thing we, we went over. Okay? But if you have any questions uh, based on the recording, please feel free to email me or... Um, you know, we could do a little bit in another session as well, if you like, okay? So, um, sorry, it turned out that you missed the first part of it, but uh, I think if you go over the recording, it'll, it'll turn out just fine. Okay, so I'm just going to go, what I've been talking about here, Samantha, is, um, I don't know if you've ever had this, but sometimes if you take a picture with a really bright flash, uh, the person's face gets kind of washed out, they call it flash blowout, and their face almost looks like a ghost. And so what I was saying was it really helps if you uh, take a piece of Kleenex, put it over in front of your flash, and it just kind of makes the flash not quite so bright. It spreads out the light more, and then you get a picture like this, which is, uh, you know, a little bit better looking picture, I think, eh? Does that make sense? You should give it a try next time you take a picture. All right, so the last thing, or one of the last things, I guess, maybe a few more things. Um, so now at this point, we're going to talk just about, we talked before about if it's a bright sunny day, you use a low ISO number, like 100. Now if it's the opposite, if you've got low lighting conditions, for instance, if you're in a concert or something like that, then you want to use a high ISO number, so something like ISO 800, okay? And that'll help you to get more light coming into the camera. Okay, so bright sunny day, low ISO number like 100, low lighting conditions, high ISO number like 400 or 800. Okay? So the next picture here is showing something called color contrast. And what that means is you've got a color wheel here. And what you want to do to get color contrast <clears throat> is choose two colors that are across from one another on this color wheel. So for instance, you can see like blue and purple are across from one another, orange and blue. Did I say blue and purple? Yellow and purple are across from one another, blue and orange. Okay? So to get good color contrast, you want to have two numbers, that, or two colors, I should say, that are across from one another, one another. Okay? Does that make sense? Sorry, sometimes when I talk for <clears throat> a long time on these sessions, and I had some other ones today, might start getting a little tongue-tied. Alrighty. Um, now what this is showing us here is um, it's showing us that you want to use a wide angle lens for certain things, but other things it's not good to have a wide angle lens. Okay, so um, something like a <clears throat> something like a portrait is better for zooming in, right? Um, can you guys think of any other kinds of pictures that are good for a wide angle lens? What kind of situations do you think are good for having a really wide angle where you've got, you know, just think about a, a really large angle? Can you think of any situations that are good for a large angle? Okay. Um, something like a landscape picture, 
would be a large angle. Um, a group picture where you have a number of people in it, like a class picture or something like that. Okay. So I would say like landscape, this would be like a cityscape picture, you could call it, you know, where you're taking a, an area of the city. So landscape, cityscape, and group pictures are all pretty good for um, having a wide angle lens. Okay. So um, guess what? We're actually at the end now. And um, so I guess we'll wrap it up at this point. And again, Samantha, please check out the recording and I'll send that to both of you guys later on. Okay? And let me know if you have any questions. So guys, uh, thanks for coming to the session and um, hope you have an awesome rest of the day. Okay. Well, take care and God bless.